medicine, it became abundantly clear to her that the right to affordable public education and access to adequate health care are inextricably linked. Both are necessary, as well as critical to building a healthy, successful community. Prior to the beginning of her career in education, Dawn worked alongside a nurse lobbyist. This afforded her the opportunity to engage in community stakeholder meetings concerning Medicaid expansion, lobby as an advocate for health care access, and attend the 2014 General Assembly session. While at the GA, Dawn was approached by the Assistant Commissioner for Virginia Department for Behavioral Health and Department Services. He prompted Dawn to utilize her education and experience to solve the problem of inadequate community-based care. Due to Dawn's success in this field, Dawn is now the Director of the Office of Integrated Health, and in this role, Dawn manages a multi-million dollar state budget and builds strong relationship with state and local agencies to implement local community programs and construct public policy for individuals with developmental disabilities. She's also begun to work to partner primary care service providers with mental health services. Dawn's numerous, numerous experiences include being the first participant in the Virginia Nurse Advocate Health Policy Fellowship creating beneficial relationships with Virginia's elected representatives and developing public policy in her work as a civil servant. It helped her to identify the troubling disconnect between political maneuvering and our government's obligation to serve the people. This is what has fueled Don's desire to run for office. Next round of applause for these. So, Don, let's open up the questions with you. Question number one for you as a health and medical professional. How do you feel about Medicaid expansion in the Commonwealth, and would you promote legislation to this effect, and can the Commonwealth afford it? Don? Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Greg. Thank you uh, to Karen Owen, who we spent a lot of time corresponding with before uh, getting here today. And I appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to us uh, and what we have to say today. Medicaid expansion, um, as a healthcare pro professional, has been um, it's, it's been a very curious thing to me that we do have not expanded Medicaid. I understand this issue. I can give you a bunch of data. Um, for example, we have 400,000 Virginians without coverage. Uh, we have 1,600 just here in the 68. It's, um, it's affecting our people, and we have really uh, framed this, at least the DA has framed this, as a, an issue of um, philosophical differences. I see this really as a moral issue. I have taken care of patients as a nurse practitioner, I worked as a hospitalist in the rural community where my entire job was to care for people with Medicaid and the indigent. <clears throat> there is a clear difference when you come to the hospital and you have had some type of insurance versus you've had no primary care and no insurance. What we're facing are people who are very ill by the time they come to the hospital. And so it takes a great deal of resources to stabilize them. And that's really all we do in the hospital anymore. You know, we get people out of crisis, we stabilize them, and we send them on their way. On their way for somebody who doesn't have insurance is to whatever environment they worked at or, or live in and, and have nobody to follow up with them. We know that it's a much more effective teaching strategy to have people come when they're not in distress and get regular you know, education um, that happens as part of the primary care experience. So it really is um, a personal issue that I've seen as a clinician. As a citizen, I think that it's been fiscally irresponsible. We have literally left $10.4 billion on the table. Now these federal funds, they're not going to waste because 31 other states who have expanded Medicaid get to use our federal tax dollars to do that. I have a problem with that. I think that we, should be much more fiscally responsible. We should have taken that money, and we would not be behind the curve that we are now faced with if, in fact, uh, our Medicaid funding changes. So I hope that we have the opportunity to expand Medicaid. I think the answer to some of the concerns has to do with reducing costs. I've been in the field for a long time and have a lot of thoughts about that, and there are many other equally smart people who have additional thoughts to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Don.
Would you care to respond? Yes, no, you want to add or you want to go on with the questions? We'll open it up if you have something to say about that question, but we do have questions for you as well. Um, well, I defer to the moderator. If you, if you wish for me to respond, I'm happy to. We'll keep that fishing. How about that? We'll go on to the next question. Okay. Mr. Lepasi, Virginia is the only state in the union where cities and counties are entirely separate entities from one another. Does this make Virginia smarter than everyone else or perhaps not so much? Doesn't duplication of governmental entities result in a waste of taxpayer money and in its own way result in a government that governs more rather than the government that governs least, which has been called Virginia way? So, uh, Greg, I, I would... I would say this, uh, in general, um, I believe that we should have a government that doesn't waste the taxpayers' dollars, that uh, addresses uh, the concerns and the needs of the community in a way that we expect from the government, but in a way that's fiscally responsible. And so, uh, to that degree, uh, you know, I'm, that would be the way I look at things. Uh, you know, I was on the city council for six years. Um, I remember sitting, you sit right next to Tim Kaine in, that, uh, in our meetings in the council, and uh, we would have discussions such, such as this. Wouldn't it be so much better if there was uh, greater regional cooperation? Uh, wouldn't it be more efficient if there was uh, more uh, greater regional cooperation? So these are things that you know, I've been grappling with for probably close to 20 years. Um, and so I think, I think to the degree that we're able to cooperate in particular matters uh, as they, because I represent Enrico, Richmond, and Chesterfield, so I'm keenly aware of this, that to the degree that we're able to engage with one another and we can work jointly in those things that we can work jointly on, then we should pursue those. Um, we, you know, when I was on city council, uh, we, had, we had a great convention center downtown that was done with regional, regional uh, money and regional uh, cooperation. Uh, we've had many instances of that uh, happening. And I think as we move forward, we need to do more of that, okay? So, I was on city council for six years. The first time I proposed this was 10 years ago when I was, when I was um, running for the first time for the House of Delegates to equalize the board membership of the RMA, the Richmond Metropolitan Association. Because if you'll recall, the board membership was like eight city, seven city, three Enrico County, three Chesterfield County. So there was a huge imbalance on that body. It's a regional body. It was the body that managed the, um, the diamond. Okay? And so as I, was, as I was walking around talking to people, this was something that was uh, uh, adversely impacting our ability to work well together as a region. And when I first proposed equalizing the board, I was it vehemently attacked um, by people as like being divisive and this, that, and the other. It was the exact opposite, okay? I'm trying to create an entity where people are sitting at a table. They're gonna put in equal money. They're gonna be expected to do equal things. And so there should be equal representation at that table. And if people, if people are sitting at a table and they're being treated fairly, then you're gonna come up with good, fair decision making and you're gonna work well and better as a region together. So I fought on this thing in the General Assembly for like six years, okay? Year after year came back. Because it's not, it's not easy passing a law. It's tough, you gotta to try to win over people's minds. You have to explain to them uh, what you're trying to accomplish. And the idea is to have a regional body where people want to go do things, where they're going to want to do regional things that they can do together. Now, how is this going to affect us? It might not be for 15 or 20 years. It might be sooner than what we think. 
But having the entity there is critical. And having people who are leaders who are thinking about these things to try to help enable regional cooperation is critical. And so I'm proud of the work I've done as it relates to regional cooperation because when I'm gone, and I'll be gone at some point, but when I'm gone, I'll know that I did the right job for the people and have done the right job for the region. And that makes me feel good about being in public service because this is what it is. Sometimes you take the heat, but it's public service. Thank you, Mr. Lupasi. <laughs> Dr. Adams, the o opioid crisis has hit home in Virginia as it has in many states, and this is an issue that strikes very close to home because I just lost my dear cousin, Sean, who was 30 years old, to heroin overdose. What potential solutions do you see that you would like to put forward and how to deal with this ongoing crisis and growing crisis? And I'm sorry for your loss, it's really horrible. The opioid epidemic um, is just an absolute travesty on our society. We see that in every state, the Commonwealth has not escaped that. It has surpassed uh, motor vehicle deaths. Um, and, and I will say that um, as a clinician, it, it's, it, it's so um, much more complicated of an issue uh, than most people even consider it to be. And I do think that the General Assembly last, this last session made some steps forward. Um, it is very important that we support our first responders uh, and also family members uh, by passing a law that allows for Narcan to be accessible as a drug that they, it will reverse the effects of things like heroin and prevent the fatalities that are often associated with opioids. <coughs> it's a complicated issue because it not only um, affects people who are seeking uh, drugs illegally, it, it affects people who need medication uh, for the purposes of pain and chronic pain. And I think one of the mistakes that, or th something that actually could have been done better in the General Assembly is not legislate uh, medical um, prescriptions. I, I think that uh, there, we are too quick to say this is the fault, we lay the fault at prescribers and physicians. Um, and I think they would, that people go to medical school and get training so that they do that. Could they do that better? Do they need more training? Absolutely. So I think that is a separate piece. Um, what's really uh, at, the, uh, at the underlying causes of opioid addiction is something that I think we need to be looking at as a community. What I'm really interested in is building healthier communities through better public policy. And what that means is that first we have to have open discussions about what is going on, what is at the root of this. And I really believe we have an epidemic of social isolation and we have entirely too many me mental health problems in our society today. I also believe that some of what contributes to that is social media and media because we end up isolating ourselves in thought bubbles that where people only think like each other and we're not in community where we're actually having larger discussions, hard conversations. One of the things that nurses do well and nurse practitioners do well are have those hard conversations, irrespective of socioeconomic status or educational levels. We try to make the really complicated things that are in medicine and sometimes with titles too long and, and physicians talking too quickly and break it down to something that's reasonable and digestible in the time. We have to take the similar approach, even as legislators. We need to involve the community in the decision making going forward. We need to make sure that we understand what is at the root of the problem and how it affects each community. You know, how it affects the 68th is maybe a very different reason than why it affects Wise County. What we know about Wise County is that they are just economically depressed and people are depressed. And so it makes some degree of sense that they would not want to feel that depression but people just don't have the skill set to do it differently in a more positive way. So we have got to really look at this as not just um, a, a crisis because it results in death, but a crisis that speaks to our need as community to come together and solve problems with compassion and love. And I know that sounds odd for a political person to say that, uh, but I've always worked through love and I think that that's very, very important. I think that's a, a, a needed. Um, the opioid epidemic is just one of our major uh, problems and 
I hope that if we elect people that actually understand it better and can talk about this better, that that will make a, a difference to our larger community. Uh, right now in the House, we only have nine people with a health care background. Seven of them uh, are in the Republican Party and two are in the Democratic Party. Why this is a problem is because we don't have strong advocates for other ways to look at things. And one of the ways that I want to look at things is to bring community stakeholders routinely as part of the conversation so that we know in real time what's going on and not wait until just before session or, or right when it's time to craft legislation. We need to be proactive and not reactive in this situation. Mr. Lombasi, all you have to do is just turn the television on, flip on the phone, or turn the radio on. You know that there has been a lot of discussion of the removal of monuments to Confederate generals at Jefferson Davis, especially in light of recent events down the road in Charlottesville. State law prohibits removal of the monuments from <coughs> county properties, and the GA fairly recently tried to change the law to clarify the law meant that all monuments are protected no matter where and when they were erected. But the legislation was vetoed by Governor McCollum. Should cities be permitted to remove or reposition these monuments elsewhere? And how do you feel about this issue? Greg, I've represented um, that area of Monument Avenue for close to 18 years um, in one way or form or another in public office. And um, I served in the city of Richmond um, first as a city council member and then second as president of Richmond City Council. And I think that what we grappled with the most and what we continue to grapple with is improving the lives of our citizens that we represent. And um, you know, McAuliffe, Governor McAuliffe came out last week and said that uh, he thought that the city should focus its attention on the schools. You're talking about, depending on the estimates you hear, uh, millions of dollars to remove these. Um, I have been uh, involved in one way, shape, or form for a very long time in trying to make good decisions. And my thought is that decisions that are made in haste are typically not good decisions. So I think a thoughtful process is important. And I think that uh, the city and the citizens would be uh, much better served if we focused our attention, uh, attentions on improving the schools and the condition of our schools. Um, we have schools in the city of Richmond that young children attend, school-age children attend, where the teachers are forced to wear masks to teach the class. That's a failing of our government. That is a moral issue. And it's something that needs to be corrected. There have been reports in the newspaper and in, in the uh, various, and you know, from TV outlets that they had ceilings where things had fallen out of the out of the ceiling, hit people in the head, hit the kids in the head. I was uh, I was at a um, gathering last week with the president of Richmond for Crusade for Voters. We we're talking about this issue. She told me that she had talked to a gentleman who was speaking to, uh, speaking to kids at George Wythe High School, and the kids were sitting in the chairs in their, in their, uh, in their um, auditorium. And they were all sitting like this with their feet up. I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't have the flexibility to do it anymore. <laughs> but, but, but they had their feet up. And he's like, what in the world? What are y'all doing? And they told him they had rats and mice going by there. I was having 
girlfriend of mine, a friend of mine who we were at our house and a few people were talking about this issue. She goes and teaches down in the East End and some uh, schools down in the East End. And she put her first day there, she put her purse down on the ground and, and one of the teachers said, you don't want to do that. What do you mean? Because you don't want you to be carrying out of here. Someone will crawl up and in your purse. Okay. This is a this is a failing of ours, and we, in as much as we can, need to try to fix it. Um, and I'm here recently. Paul Goldman, who's a former chairman of the Democratic Party of Virginia, he has circulated a petition for. 16, he got 16,000 Richmond residents to sign this petition. 16,000. If you took it statewide, it would be on par with getting 500,000 signatures. That's how bad the populace wants us to address this issue. And it's going to put it on the ballot. And I view this, I view this as a very beneficial thing for the mayor. Because when the office of the mayor was created, it was created for one person to speak for the will of the people. And where we've had difficulties in the city has been when every little fiefdom couldn't be brought together to get a job done. So they created the system that we have, a strong mayor. And this mayor, with the power of the people behind him, voting on this issue will give him the strength and the power to force people to make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make. And it's important because in this country, education is the equalizer for everybody. The more people that, the more young people that we can reach and touch and improve their lives and then show them that they can uh, see something better, experience something better, the better chance that we're gonna have to spend less money on jails the better chance that we're going to have less people sticking a gun in our face. And so we have an obligation to get behind this. And I've already told them, I expect this is going to get passed down by the people overwhelmingly. And I'm going to carry the legislation in the General Assembly. And uh, I've had a few uh, legislators that have called me and said, we're with you. So it's the this region. What is the resolution? I'm sorry. What did the resolution say that Mr. Goldman is circulating? The resolution, uh, the resolution says that should the city charter be amended, is that, is that okay? It's fine. It's fine. Keep it, keep this, it is keep it interest, this is of interest for a group like this. I mean, yeah. Extremely important. Um, the resolution says should the charter of the city should the charter of the city of Richmond be amended to ask the mayor to come up with a plan for the. Um, a comprehensive plan for the uh, modernization of our schools within six months without raising taxes or declare it's impossible to do so. That's what it says. And um, that's what it says. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Um, Greg? Yes, ma'am. As, as a resident of Richmond City for more than two decades, I'd, I'd also like to answer this Please, question. Please, go for it. Is this better? Can you hear it better? Yes. 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 I'm sorry, I'm not used to holding a microphone. Um, so I've thought a lot about the monuments. Um, it's, it's extremely disturbing what's going on with monuments. And, you know, I've lived in the fan, and I've lived there for more than two decades. As I understand it, the monuments have been controversial since they were erected. And, you know, we have two distinct opinions that I hear in community about the monuments. And so I think it was a strong sign of leadership for our mayor to establish a commission where people could come together and have the discussions about all of the issues as it relates to the monuments and all of the potential solutions. Now, we know that there is a huge part of the population who finds these monuments hurtful. And they didn't just start to find that, They've always felt they were hurtful. And we also know that just like Saturday, we have hate groups that leverage these monuments as totems of hate.
who represent their opinion. Now we also have a large group of people in the city and in our district who see these monuments as a part of history. They see them as pieces of museum-esque type art in the community. They're a source of tourism dollars. And we know that if we remove them, they're very likely going to change property values and also the sort of narrative of our city. And so that is why it is extremely important that all positions are heard about why they feel what they feel and what to do going forward. As a citizen of Richmond City, I look forward to those discussions. Now, since this also turned into to an education question, I would like to say this. With all respect, our, my opponent, our current delegate, has had 10 years in the General Assembly to make effective legislation to improve our schools. And that is not what has happened. What has happened has been proposals to voucherize our school system, a proposal which essentially creates two school systems that we must now fund. Further, the Virginia Constitution states that we shall establish from kindergarten through high school a strong, it actually says, a high quality educational system that is not only developed but is constantly maintained. This has been the failure. Yes, buildings are a problem. Of course they're a problem. But the failure is much greater than that. We need stronger public education. I am a product of public education in Virginia. I grew up in the military. We landed in Northern Virginia when I was in eighth grade, and I've stayed in Virginia mostly since. I went to eighth grade, all of high school, and four public universities. I know the Virginia school system. It is appalling to me that education is not our number one priority. Education is the opportunity that fosters every other thing that we do in life. It is our workforce, it's our future taxpayers, it's the people who will ultimately run this district, this city, and this commonwealth. I feel very strongly that as the eighth richest state in the, in the entire nation, that we can do better than more than $7 an hour on, below the national average in paying our teachers. That to me makes no sense. I'm a huge advocate for Virginia public schools, as a product of Virginia uh, public schools, and I imagine that is why I am endorsed by the Virginia Education Association. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Moving on to an issue that affects us all, transportation. Dr. Adams, how would you address Virginia's infrastructure needs? not just here in the Richmond metro area, but really Commonwealth-wide. Might you support better mass transportation, for instance, rather than attempting to pave our way out of gridlock on our highways? Do you support high-speed rail, for instance, even if that meant significant alterations to the tracks running through Ashland? <laughs> Thanks for that. And you thought the statues <laughs> were a hotbed button. Right, yeah, Ashland's not too happy. Well, you know, I think one of the things that we have uh, done well in the last couple of years is, is implement a new um, system for prioritizing transportation like legislation, the smart system, which takes some of the politics out of that. Clearly, infrastructure needs to be maintained, and I think that that is a source of economic growth opportunities, um, our bridges and roads. But more than that, and I think one of the most significant uh, pieces of infrastructure that we could uh, implement and, and it would create jobs but it would also um, really expand opportunity both in education and health is widespread working broadband that infrastructure in and of itself will change lives across the commonwealth we know that there is very little access to health care in the western part of the commonwealth we know that uh, broadband is a source of you know, some type of broadband is usually a source of all of our information. We love the Google, the Facebook, the Twitter. You know, we love these sources of information, but you can't get that without satellite connection or dial-up or something that's infinitely slow. It doesn't make sense. 
We also know that telehealth works really well, especially for consultant-based services like psychiatry, dermatology, and some uh, assistant-like services. There is currently a study going on um, that looks at utilizing advanced practice nurses in conjunction with uh, consultant uh, physicians to provide access to increased access to care in rural areas. This is a super important uh, study. Um, there are many ways to look at that, and uh, what we know about it right now is that um, it's not a fully uh, functional system because of the lack of physician availability. But we do know that telehealth has science behind it as being effective, um, important, and a good cost-effective solution. Um, I think other infrastructure that we can use is to have uh, transportation that might include higher speed rail, but as I understand it, um, it, it's really billions of dollars to study the effects. There are many different bodies that are associated with determining whether if that's feasible. And so uh, that would be something I would want to learn much more about. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to address the question. Greg, before you ask the next question, can I say something about education? Please, it's 42% of our budget. We'd Please like to talk about for just a second, because I don't want anybody leaving here thinking that I don't care about education, public education. Thank you. Okay, so last year we had our budget and we added a billion dollars to K through 12 education. We also have given teachers raises four out of the last five years. So I very much strongly believe in a solid public education system. About a couple of things that have come up in the last four years that I think are Posted my position. I, I definitely support independent and nonpartisan commission to, to do this. Um, and I believe what I read was that um, my opponent doesn't believe that there is such thing as a nonpartisan person. Um, and that bothered me because, uh, as we heard earlier, his primary job is to appoint judges. And so one would hope that our judges are capable of being nonpartisan. So I'm, I'm super grateful for that change. I also would ask you to, to please look at a map of District 68. Um, it has been likened uh, to a sleeping moose. <laughs> so I think anything with that many jagged edges calls into question uh, fair line drawing. Um, lastly, you know, I, I know that my opponent was um, sitting in his current position when the lines were redrawn. Uh, so all the more reason that I'm grateful he's reconsidered uh, his position on redistricting. Okay, thank you. So, Adam, this question is for you. In many Virginia localities are included, um, the number of homeless people on our streets seems to just grow about a year. It has been suggested that many of them are suffering from some sort of mental illness. Some of the state institutions that were created to handle this problem no longer exist, and many families are not equipped to handle it themselves. In light of the sad circumstances surrounding <coughs> State Senator P. Deeds' son a couple of years ago, how would you propose that this problem be dealt with and from where we would find the financing? Um, so it is true that there are way too many people that are homeless. Many of them do have mental health issues and, that, and the problems are complicated. You know, our culture has uh, become accustomed to binary answers. You know, yeses and nos, uh, answers that are, you know, very straightforward. Mental health is never straightforward. Reasons that people are homeless is never straightforward. Some of it has to do with housing issues, a lack of job, um, opportunities, uh, mental illness for sure. Um, there are many reasons. And so, I was very grateful to see that mental health finally got some spotlight in the past session. You know, we had an opportunity to affect mental health years ago, and that was with the Virginia Tech shooting. It really shone a huge spotlight on mental health issues. But when it became more personal, when it affected one of their own, I think that it really impacted the General Assembly to start to listen to how we go about treating people with severe mental illness. Our funding stream uh, that we dedicated to that 
uh, increased. And so I think that, you know, they have already started that path. And yes, we need more funding. Uh, but we also need more uh, holistically, uh, holistic approaches to mental health. We need to have uh, more integrated approaches. What I've learned in state government, and part of why I'm running, is that there are just too many silos and too many people who aren't communicating well with one another. There's a lack of true um, camaraderie in how we're making decisions as a community. And we have got to look at building healthier communities through our public policy. There are innovative and effective methods for reducing costs in behavioral health, and we need to explore all of them. There are also opportunities to create better housing. One of the real travesties of our Richmond City, and as beautiful and wonderful it is, we have some, is our public housing projects. You know, my opponent was talking earlier about somebody having to go into school. Well, I worked for years in those projects, and I put plastic bags on my feet, and I only carried my stethoscope, my pen, and um, a blood pressure cuff. And that was because the roaches were so bold, they could change the remote control if they wanted to. <laughs> The public housing in, in Richmond is atrocious, and we have many problems, but we know that some solutions work. And some of the reasons that communities used to work is because people who are physicians and people who are plumbers used to live in the same community. And we need to incentivize those types of communities where we have the entire socioeconomic spectrum living in similar places so that we can start to shift this culturally. Dr. thank you. This is the final question for me, and then we'll be opening up to the floor for three or four questions with time remaining. Uh, Mr. Labonte, Virginia has one of the lowest gasoline and cigarette taxes in the United States. In order to pay for the many transportation and infrastructure needs within the Commonwealth, would you consider raising taxes on these items? Um, uh, we already did, and I voted for it. So. I don't, I mean, so the answer is yes. Yes, yes. Okay. That's why I'm perplexed because we just did that. But I, I mean, we did it. Um, let's see, when did we do it? No, no, no. <laughs> but we just did it with uh, this past. No, it wouldn't have been while we called. So it was four years ago. Four years ago. Yeah, we had a transportation plan when we raised the. Okay. So. One of the questions that was proposed. Well, I mean, let me let me just I mean, let me let me add to it. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, a, a critical function for us is to have a good uh, road system and to have a healthy economic environment because we need to move people and goods efficiently about. So, to, to the degree that we can, we have to provide the uh, financial resources necessary to make that happen. So um, I'm, I'm thinking that what we did four years ago was very a very healthy thing. And I'm um, guessing that it is working very well, especially here recently with the rising in the price of gas because we now have it based on how much uh, the gas price is which was a change, because we used to, remember we used to do the billing, or we used to do the, the tax as a per gallon amount. So it was like 16 cents, and then as Mr. Ucrop said, it was stuck at 16 cents for like 30 years, so it was ridiculous. It was, it was we were losing the power of, of the money just because of the time value of money. So we changed it four years ago so that uh, we, we wouldn't raise the revenue in that manner. And so I think it's worth, had it not, I'm sure that, I mean, I would, I know that we would have heard these things from Governor McAuliffe and there would be proposals to, to, to make the adjustments necessary to, to make sure that we have a first class infrastructure because he and I and all of us care about the economic environment of the Commonwealth. It's critical. Mr. Posse, thank you. I'd like to open the floor now. Uh, any questions for the candidates? Yes, please. Uh, Greg, I'd like yes, to reprise question number one on Medicaid for the student posse to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, 
How do you feel about Medicaid expansion in Virginia? Would you promote legislation to this effect? And can the Commonwealth afford it? Medicaid is um, health care for people that are in extreme economic bad conditions. And that's what it is. So it's, uh, it's government health care for, and that's, it's not the, for the extreme poor, I guess is the best way that you can, that you can phrase it. I know that's, so, so that's what we're talking about. Now, we want for folks that are in very challenged positions to challenge economic positions to have, especially children and, and uh, folks that are in this position, to have a safety net. Okay. Today, today, we did not, we have not as of yet, and have not uh, expanded Medicaid. We have not done it, I voted against it. We spend 23% of our state budget, 23% of our state budget on Medicaid today. Almost a quarter of our budget is spent on health care for the extreme poor. Now, obviously, we would love to do more. There's always the desire to do more. But we have to make sometimes difficult decisions as it relates to the other things that we spend our money on. So a quarter of 23%, not quite a quarter, but 23% we spend of our state budget on the health care for Medicaid. And then we have K-12 K, K schools, which is about 42%. We've got police, we've got parks, we have all the other obligations of the state government that we also have to fund. And so when, they, when the expansion was done at the federal level, they didn't pay for it. They didn't pay for it because if they paid for it, when the expansion was done at the federal level, they didn't pay for it. Had they paid for it, they wouldn't be saying for me that we have to pay more. Okay? And so, the decision is, do you cut money for K-12, do you cut money for police, or do you raise the taxes? I haven't seen that proposal. She said raise the cigarette tax. I haven't seen that proposal. But, but I'm not sure that that's going to produce enough, but I understand that. So, so yeah, it's, it, this, is a very, this is a very difficult issue, you know? But we have to make we have to make these decisions based upon the information that we have, and I think if you look what has happened in many of these other states that have done this, uh, they are uh, bankrupting their their budgets there, and uh, and that has not been healthy. We have typically, I'll take a question. I'm gonna dodge it. So we we have typically, in the Commonwealth try to do these things, try to do things in a learned way and in a careful way so that we don't end up being in situations where our economic spread is personally impacted. Thank you, Bill. Yes, ma'am. My understanding is that the Medicaid Medicaid, we can't do more. These are our federal dollars coming back. 
I understand what you have been told, and I understand that perhaps that is what you believe. If it had been such a great idea when they passed this at the federal level, they could have just made it, they could have just passed, passed it and raised your taxes right then and there. But they didn't do that. They play a shell game and then they make me look like the bad guy because I won't agree. I don't agree to raise your taxes. So that's the problem. And so you're going to pay. They just want me to make you pay. They didn't want to make you pay. And if they wanted to pay, we wouldn't be $22 trillion. It'd be a lot more than that in debt. So these are, these are, this is the situation. And, um, you know, we, I have to deal with the question that's before me. Am I raising the taxes or cutting the services? And we spent, and it'd be one thing if we weren't spending an awful lot of money in this regard. And then, so, thank you, Mr. Lupo. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Yes, ma'am, right here. I would vote. I would vote against that. that I would vote against that. Bill. Do, you, do you want to follow up? The question was, why didn't I? Okay, we we have many many bills down there. Okay, so I don't remember when this came up. I I I got to tell you, I vote on a lot of bills when I'm down there. A lot. Okay, occasionally we miss some. And um, and I'll you know I'm, I'm no worse or better than than anybody down there you know and so you ask me a question I give you the answer. Thank you. Okay. I didn't have an opportunity to vote. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what is important to know is when um, you know and just look I mean look at the record for yourself when there is an opportunity to vote about a woman's uh, right to choose in her own body. Um, my opponents voted for the transvaginal ultrasound bill um, against uh, uh, wanting to defund one of the only sources for poor women to obtain uh, health care at Planned Parenthood. And uh, so I think that uh, you know, voting on important issues is important. And I know from just studying the General Assembly that um, people rally around the votes they want to make. Uh, they're back, back room texting, get out, get out here and support this bill. Uh, so I think when votes are important, uh, they're cast. Sir, you had one question. Yeah. Is this, are the questions to both people or just to, to be both? both? Okay, well, maybe both would, would like to address this. One of the things that people have talked about poor, are, poor, are poor and, and fat, uh, fees and taxes. Well, in Virginia, uh, people who... who uh, uh, who don't pay their fines in traffic court and other smaller uh, traffic, minor traffic, tra traffic offenses uh, have the uh, opportunity to have their driver's license uh, lifted, taken from them. Uh, a lot of people think that's a, uh, a discrimination to poor people in particular, the working poor specifically. So I'd like to know what, uh, uh, what Ms. Adams and Mr. Lepasi would say about that. Mr. Lepasi. I mean, I'm sure she's going to agree with me. Um, all right, so I've been working on this issue for four years. I'm on the board of an uh, organization called um, Drive to Work. Uh, Randy Rollins is the head of it. And um, I've been a, either a prosecutor in the criminal justice system, either as a prosecutor or a defense attorney for over 20, probably close to 25 years. And the issue is, is that people 
get a, a fairly de minimis, uh, very small uh, traffic offense. They can't afford to pay the fines. They get fined by the court. And then if they don't pay the fines, it's, it's people that are affected that don't have the money. They just don't have the money to pay it. If they had it, they had it, if they had it, they'd pay it. So their, their license gets suspended, and then they still have to drive to try to get to work. So they're driving to work or going to pick up their wife from work, and the man pulls them over because they got a tail light out or something hanging from the mirror. And, uh, and then they take them to court for driving on suspended, and then we incarcerate them for this. So it's like a debtor's prison, and it's terrible, it's awful. And I've been dealing with so for like four years I've worked on this issue, okay? I, it took me two years to get them to agree to study it, to just study it. So um, it's a lot of meetings to try to get them to study it. This past year, right before the session, Mumo knows because he's down there. This past year, right before the session, Governor McAuliffe, which when you have a bully pulpit, people listen. And to his credit, he brought this to everyone's attention. And then all of a sudden, it started getting some traction, and they came and said, well, what do you think? What, what are the things we could do? And so I got to be the dumb luck would have it. I got to be the chief patron of this, and, and the idea is get people on a payment plan so that as long as they follow their payment plan, they can keep their license, and then if they can keep their license, they can go to work, which is great, because that's all, there is dignity in work. There is value in work. We want people to go to work. If they're working, they're raising, they're helping raise their families, and the communities are better, and they're setting a good example for their kids. So I thought it was awesome. It worked out. This is your government at work, and uh, and and I think it was a, a great thing. And, um, and you know, that, those are kind of things that you know you. I think that you want out of your elected official to do. Thank you, Um, well, I'm, I'm, I, I do agree. I mean, I think that's great. Um, it, it does not affect a majority of our uh, constituency or the majority of the Commonwealth. And, and I think one of the things that was mentioned was, um, you know, it keeps people out of debtor's prison. And I would really like to see us have more legislation that keeps people out of prison prison. Um, I think that we could do that and also save the Commonwealth a great deal of funds by you know, looking at options to um, decriminalize marijuana, for example, would save $65 million a year, as I understand it, by keeping people out of jail. They still have to pay civil fines. It's still not legal, but it's not a felony. You don't ruin your life for making, you know, stupid mistakes. Another stupid mistake uh, is stealing stuff. You know, but $200 in this day and time and culture to destroy your life to become a felon is just incomprehensible to me. You slip an iPhone, in your purse or your, your your pocket, you've ruined your life. And we know that kids make stupid mistakes, young people make mistakes, people make mistakes out of desperation. Two hundred dollar larceny threshold is too low in this day and age, and we need to increase that um, and keep people out of jail who really shouldn't be in jail. We need them in working in our in our society. It's really important. And then the last population that really should not be jailed is a serious mentally ill. And we have a huge problem with that. We need to do something different. It will also save money to do that. Thank you, Doctor. We have time for one more question. Yes, for our 130 wrap up. In some House committees, the uh, pocket veto is still alive and well. The chairman of the committee sees a bill, or maybe several bills, that he does not like. He puts it in his pocket and it never sees the light of day, never comes before his or her House committee. So my question to both candidates is very short. Would you support a change in the House rules that states that every bill duly filed by a member of the House of Delegates must be heard in House committee? Okay, it's hard to argue this, but I just totally, 
I disagree. And I'll explain to you why. Because I've been there, I know how it works. Okay? And this is sort of like the way it works. It's what I don't like about it, but this is the way it is. They're going to put, and it goes from both sides. Extreme left and extreme right. Put in all kinds of things that absolutely, positively, nobody in their right mind would ever want to even debate about, okay, or, have, or vote on. It's a waste of time, okay? But they do it because, they, because of what Mr. Ucrop and Mr. Lusick says is they represent districts that are wholly far to the, I guess what you would call the extreme polars, okay, politically. And so they can appeal to their, their base, I guess, that's what I put it. Okay. We have a very, I mean, you know, we have to run an efficient system. Okay. I am not a full-time legislator. I am a small businessman, and I work doing my day job really hard. And that's the way y'all want to keep it, by the way. Because now i got to pay taxes. I have to live a normal life. i got to make the payroll. i got to do all those things that are person, a normal person that says, I'm making decisions, I have to think about how a normal person lives, okay? And that's important. And so, while we're down there for two months, it's part-time. Sometimes we'll have 3,000 pieces of brilliant legislation that they all want considered, okay? And we have to, I mean, yeah, there, there has got to be some, mod, some, some modicum of, of ferreting it out. And uh, so, so while I understand that it sounds good and fair that every single piece of legislation should be heard, I, I don't think that that's realistic, and I don't think it's I don't I, don't, I think it's a, I don't think that it would be I don't think that the Commonwealth would be best served by that. I really don't. Thank you, Mr. Lepasi. Dr. Adams. So what I believe in is transparency. I believe in transparency and accountability. That's how I was raised. I was raised in a military family. I was raised in a family of service. I was raised in a family of integrity. I believe in transparency, whether it's votes or whether it is campaign finance reform. I think campaign finance reform is incredibly important, and we need to be doing that in Virginia as well. It is very difficult to do that if you've benefited from the way the system is now and we need to get people who believe in campaign finance reform. As an incumbent, um, the system works for you. But that's not how the system was designed. I've heard this metaphor, and I like it a lot. The House of Representatives, which is the people's house, has a short term to every two years, unlike the Senate. And so it's been likened to a mad dog on a short leash. It's supposed to have teeth, but you're supposed to be able to yank it back. Now, if you sit on a leash for 10 years, you could fall asleep. And I think we need effective leadership that still understands it's important to make changes and provide that leadership in the day that you're serving. That's what I believe in. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have for the question and answer. I would like to thank the Richmond First and all the members for having me here today. And a nice round, warm of applause for our candidate, Dr. Adams. Thank you, Greg, and thank you to other speakers, to Delica Lapazzi and Dr. Adams. We do have a small token of our appreciation from the club.